Continuing our discussion of medical conditions that are treated by autonomic drugs, we're going to now talk about respiratory, urinary, GI, ophthalmic, and CNS applications of autonomic drugs. Let's turn to um, managing respiratory disease. And again, I just want to emphasize the condition that we're treating is on the bullet and the agent that we're using to try to reverse that condition is underneath it. And so let's start with look, we're doing our inventory of receptors. Well, on the parasympathetic side, we have muscarinic receptors. And on the sympathetic side, we in the bronchioles, we have beta-2 receptors. And so it should make sense that um, in bronchoconstriction, we might want to use a beta-2 agonist. And the drugs I've listed in that class are tributylene and salbutamol. These are, tend to be uh, more widely accepted because of their potency against bronchoconstriction. Uh, the, use, the other drug class that would be used is to uh, block the muscarinic receptor. Uh, so using a muscarinic antagonist like atropine or glycoperolate uh, to try to block the parasympathetic effect. Um, this strategy tends to be less uh, effective and um, it is uh, usually just not as potent and part of that is predicted by the fact that the bronchioles are largely dominated by the um, sympathetic tone. And uh, therefore, that that's makes the beta-2 agonists more effective. They're more potent, too. Now, what about anaphylaxis? We talked about that before, and the, the component of anaphylaxis, to the extent it includes bronchoconstriction, um, we, we see benefit in the case of epinephrine of causing um, this bronchodilatory effect. So that will reverse bronchoconstriction. Let's take a look at uh, managing urinary tract disease with autonomic drugs. And the conditions I want to focus on are bladder atenine. That means the, the bladder is just weak and not very, doesn't contract very well. And let's remind ourselves where we have receptors. We have muscarinic receptors here on the parasympathetic side. Um, and at the sphincter, we have alpha-1 receptors. Now we have um, the and we're going to talk about, we're going to focus on these receptors. There are opposite side receptors, meaning there are muscarinic receptors at the sphincter, but they lead to relaxation. Remember, that's part of the, the micturition response. Um, and we might find that that's uh, uh, worth targeting. But most of our problems either involve bladder uh, atony or some, we want to manipulate the uh, urethral sphincter in some way. So let's look at bladder atony. Well, obviously, stimulate with a muscarinic agonist. And the example we use here is bethanicol. It's like acetylcholine, but it doesn't get degraded by cholinesterases. And we'll see this occasionally used in cats post-urethral post -urethral blockage, where the bladder may have been large for a long time, and they need some help to be able to get that bladder to contract down again. Um, urethral sphincter, um, we see incontinence in older uh, female dogs, and some, sometimes male dogs. Or, uh, uh, and then this would be a situation where we want to stimulate the alpha receptor here at the sphincter. And the drugs that we use here uh, didn't come up, uh, phenylpropanolamine and ephedrine. Um, the alpha-1 agonist effect is going to increase the tone of that sphincter. Um, and conversely, when we have a situation, uh, the best example being if you have a cat, again, that's been catheterized for urethral blockage, and then you uh, pull the catheter and you find that the cat is uh, spasming, okay? Um, you think that there's irritation, and you want to kind of reduce that or relax that a little bit, you can give an alpha-1 antagonist, prazosin. Um, you got to wor worry about its blood pressure effects, but you can give it. Um, and so what we're doing is essentially blocking this at this point um, to try to release that uh, 
uh, effect and allow more effective urination. Uh, historically, we used, because uh, prazosin was not available, we used uh, phenoxybenzamine. And this is that uh, non-competitive, uh, irreversible drug that takes some time uh, in order to be effective. Uh, and so actually the strategy post, when we had a cat that didn't, couldn't urinate, and we couldn't sort out if it was, the problem was up here at the bladder or down here at the sphincter, is that we would start both drugs at the same time. We'd start um, something like bethanicol, right there, and that would work immediately. If the cat got better immediately, we said, oh, that's due to um, the bladder being atonic. If it took longer for the cat to get better, uh, we, we generally said because it takes like three to five days to f make um, full benefit or, of this drug as it starts to bind to the uh, receptor, uh, we would say perhaps the real reason for the problem was at uh, urethral sphincter um, spasm. And uh, in a sense, we'd come to a therapeutic diagnosis of, of the post-urethral obstruction problem. Now, I've included um, managing GI motility um, not because it's easy to do. Um, perhaps to mention that it's not easy to do at all because you can imagine this is a highly coordinated um, uh, system that uh, just hitting on one receptor or leading to contraction in one place doesn't really benefit a lot. Um, but I, and I, and I want to also point out and remind you that as we stress an animal or as we put them under, uh, you know, give them, have them undergo surgery or whatever, this actually suppresses GMI, GI motility. And we need to keep that in mind and that's why I kept up in the sympathetic side of it here. Because for the most part as we try to reverse the condition called atony of the or reduced motility of the so this is reduced motility or ileus. When we see that, and we'll sometimes see that postoperatively, let's say in a horse or or uh, or even small animals, um, we would often try to use a prokinetic agent, and one of those is the dopamine antagonist metoclopramide. We mentioned it as an anti-emetic in small animals. Um, we, you might find occasionally the, the, still the historic use of bethanicol uh, in an attempt to say, hey, it looks like acetylcholine, let's give some. But the problem with that is that it would lead to contraction or maybe slightly increased tone, but it's not coordinated. It's not a coordinated contraction. So again, trying to normalize uh, particularly very complex uh, function of the GI tract in a ruminant or in a horse, um, you really need to renormalize, um, you know, through feeding, etc. Um, we mentioned the antiemetic effects, and those effects are uh, where we see adrenergic agents used as the dopamine antagonist metoclopramide. Um, it has this prokinetic effect peripherally, that is, it helps to move. Uh, it affects the sphincter, the pyloric sphincter, and opens it up and allows ingestion to move from the stomach to the intestine. And it also blocks the chemoreceptor trigger zone that is detecting circulating um, toxins that then feeds, that signal feeds to the emetic center. So it has this dual mechanism as an anti-emetic agent. Uh, that drug has to be given um, usually very frequently or in best by constant rate infusion, and so it's not something we can easily use outside of the uh, clinic. What about intestinal spasm? Well, I'm going to make the point that, that spasm itself is fairly rare, which would suggest, you know, overactivity of vagal activity. But where you have a situation where you do suspect that it might be true, uh, using a muscarinic antagonist, uh, like atropine or there are other agents that are included um, may be indicated. Of course, this could then eventually lead to ileus if you're not careful. The other reason you'll see, or we used to see agents uh, like muscarinic antagonists is that they decrease secretions. 
and sometimes that's a benefit uh, in the GI tract. Well, talking about ocular disease, uh, if you've been to an ophthalmologist who's had an interest in looking at, the, at your retina, you might go there a little bit early and receive a muscarinic antagonist of some sort to induce pupillary dilation. And this is uh, basically uh, paralyzing the, uh, the, the ciliary muscle. And that muscle is involved with constriction of the pupil. And as we said, since parasympathetic tone is dominant in the eye, you get dilation. Um, atropine has a very long effect. So usually what they're giving you is tropicamide, which is a, or something like it, that is a shorter-acting uh, agent. Now, atropine is lo relatively long-acting. There are situations, for instance, where we have uh, we want pupillary dilation in a horse to occur over a long period of time in order to reduce scarring uh, on the iris, and you might actually be using atropine. Um, the other way we can cause pupillary dilation is through stimulating the radial muscle and through the alpha-1 receptor. And this can be done with phenylephrine. Uh, can be used, cocaine will do this, uh, given topically. Um, what about inducing pupillary constriction? Well, why would we do this? Well, without going into great detail, there's some advantage in the condition that we talk about just below in glaucoma to uh, be able to constrict the pupil. And a muscarinic agonist is, is useful here. Pilocarpine can be given topically or for longer acting effects, uh, acetylcholine nesterase inhibitor of uh, physostigmine. Um, so again, glaucoma, which is due to uh, poor drainage, uh, can be benefited by constricting the pupil, opening up the angle drainage of the anterior chamber fluid. The other thing that can actually help in this situation is um, using an antagonist against uh, the beta 1 and 2 receptors called timolol, and this will also actually decrease the production of um, anterior chamber uh, fluid. So these are the autonomic drugs that we use for managing ocular disease. Autonomic drugs can also um, have effects on the CNS itself because we do have certainly norepinephrine and dopamine within the CNS. And the, the first uh, met clinical effect that we um, I want to talk about is sedation. We have a class of drugs called the alpha-2 agonists that through stimulating the and remember, this is where the next neuron is over here, uh, and this is a presynaptic neuron. By stimulating the alpha-2 receptor, we tend to reduce, okay, we reduce the um, production uh, and release of additional neurotransmitter, so decreased neurotransmitter release. And this le lens, and of course, norepinephrine itself is, a, is normally... Uh, stimulatory um, effect, but this can also occur in a cholinergic neuron, uh, which can be uh, excitatory within the central nervous system. So we lead to a sedative effect in the body, in the brain. Um, and so the, the drugs xylazine, dutomidine, and domesidine are also are in this class. Um, we have antagonists, obviously, to reverse these. This is useful. Alpha-2 antagonist, you know, himbine, can then allow you to wake the animal up um, from that effect. For You've learned, been learning separately about behavior modification, but I thought it would be useful to mention that we have drugs that, that block the reuptake, so a drug like amitriptyline will work here. And by blocking... Um, by blocking that transport uptake, we get an increased, this leads to increased uh, norepinephrine in the nerve terminal. And uh, that leads to a greater local effect of norepinephrine. 
Um, we can do similar things by um, blocking the, in this case we focus on primarily dopamine but also a little bit on norepinephrine uh, and its metabolism being suppressed by a drug called aldepronil, the monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. And this will lead to an increased synaptic dopamine and to some extent norepinephrine. And you'll learn about that drug within the context of uh, managing uh, senile conditions, particularly in the dog.